Post, makers of Post Corn Toasting, welcomes you to the house of mystery. This is Roger Elliott, otherwise known as the Mystery Man. Inviting you to join us for another storytelling session here at the House of Mystery. Well, Johnny, how was that picnic last week? Well, just well. Oh, it was wonderful, Mr. Man. Simply wonderful. I'm glad to hear it. I hope you're all remembering to stay outdoors as much as you can. Getting lots of air, sunlight, and exercise. Yeah, and, uh, postcorn toasting. Huh? <laughs> I'm sorry, Johnny, I don't think I understand that. Well, that's easy. Get lots of air, sunshine, exercise, and postcorn toasties. I thought you said your mother wouldn't take postcorn toasties on picnics. Well, uh, at first she wouldn't. But you found a way. Yeah, <laughs> I found a way, all right. Without dishes and spoons, too, Miss Jean. Well, how can you eat postcorn toasties without a bowl and a spoon? I uh, you give up? I give up. Right out of the fresh protective box. Uh, just like uh, postcorn toasties was uh, nuts. Or candy or popcorn. Postcorn toasties are delicious that way. That's a wonderful yeah. idea. Oh. No fuss, no bother, but still you can take postcorn toasties with you on your picnic, automobile trips, or swimming parties. Just tuck a fresh protective box of postcorn toasties in with your luggage and eat those tender, crisp, golden brown flakes as you would nuts or candy, right out of the box. And you can be sure of one thing. The special fresh protective box will keep postcorn toasties fresh and crisp until the last golden flake has been eaten. Thank you, Ruth and Johnny, for a wonderful suggestion. Oh, that's okay. And now I see it's time for today's mystery. The story I call A Gift from the Dead. It began in a hotel in San Francisco, where I'd taken a room to wait for Paul Sheldon, an old friend of mine who was flying in from Kansas City to join me. Some weeks ago, Paul and I had been invited by his sister, Jane Kovarak, to spend a few days at her home in the beautiful but rugged Big Sur country, 150 miles south of San Francisco. We'd accepted Jane's invitation with enthusiasm as evidence of her complete recovery from the shock of her husband's death. Well, my thoughts were miles away when the bellboy knocked on my door and handed me a letter. It was from Jane. I opened it and began to read. But I was hardly beyond the first line when a vague feeling of uneasiness crept over me. The note was brief and to the point. She was canceling her invitation. As the day wore on, I reread the letter several times, each time feeling more uneasy. And by afternoon, I found myself pacing restlessly back and forth, impatient for Paul's arrival. I was about to leave for the airport to meet his plane when a long-distance telephone call stopped me. It was a woman, her voice tight with panic. Mr. Roger Elliott? Yes? Who's this? My name is Craig, Miss Alma Craig. Yes? I'm Mrs. Kovrak's housekeeper. I see. Mr. Elliott, you must come at once. Mrs. Kovrak needs help. But I just got a letter from her canceling the invitation. I know that's why I'm calling. We're in danger, Mr. Elliott. You must come. What kind of danger, Miss Craig? The master of this house has returned. We've heard him. He's here. Basil Kovrak has come back. Mr. Elliott, he's come back from the dead. And with a sharp click of the receiver, Miss Craig's voice was gone. Something had to be done, and quickly. I packed my bag, checked out of the hotel, and drove at once to the airport. Paul's plane landed as I arrived, and from the gate I watched the passengers unload. As Paul hurried toward me, a messenger handed him a telegram. He stopped to read it, and the smile of greeting quickly vanished from his face. I went through the gate to meet him. Roger, read this. It's from Jane. Paul, am canceling invitation. Please do not come. Explanation follows. Jane. What do you make of it, Roger? I fly over 2,000 miles to visit her, and then she tells me to stay away. Well, you're not going to. We're going to see Jane, and I think we'd better hurry. (laughs) 
A bank of heavy clouds hung over the ocean to the west as we turned onto Highway 101 and started toward the Big Sur country. As the miles clicked by, I told Paul about the letter I had received from Jane and the frantic phone call from her housekeeper. When I repeated what she'd told me about Basil Kovarak, Paul's eyes grew hard and he spoke with an undertone of bitterness. Roger, I opposed that marriage from the first moment I met Basil Kovarak. I could understand why Jane was so completely infatuated. He was handsome, wealthy, and thoroughly educated. But to me, there was something cold and brutal about him. Something odd and difficult to define. And he was proud, almost insanely proud. The Kovarak name is an old one. A titled European family, wasn't it? Yes, Basil was a count or something. The last heir, I believe. Well, immediately after the marriage, he took Jane to live in the house where she is now. Oh, it's a strange place, Roger. Huge and rambling, perched on a cliff overlooking the sea. Nothing modern in it except the telephone. Kovarak kept it exactly like a like an ancient feudal castle. Well, was he in business, Paul? How did he spend his time? Well, near as I can tell, he devoted all of it to preserving the Kovarak family traditions. He had no other interest. He and Jane lived there alone. No one else but the two servants, Miss Craig and a handyman, was ever permitted on the place. Not even I. That's strange. Certainly doesn't sound like Jane. Oh, she's changed, Roger. Why, when they'd been married about three years, I visited her unexpectedly. And would you believe it? She refused to see me. Sent word she wasn't feeling well. But I saw Basil. He came out of his library while I was waiting at the door. He looked at me with those strange, dark eyes of his. Then he approached me. I got the coldest reception of my life. Mr. Paul Sheldon. Hello, Basil. You've come to see my wife, I presume. Yes, I plan to see my sister. Mrs. Kovarak does not wish to be disturbed. And I, for my part, do not wish the routine of my household disrupted. We have nothing in common here with the outside world. And it is not our wish to change. But I don't understand. I've There's come a no long way. There's no need to pursue the matter further, Mrs. Kovarak. And I do not wish to be intruded upon. Miss Craig... Please show Mr. Sheldon out. So there was nothing for me to do but go away. And that's a pretty accurate picture of Basil Kovrak, Roger. He had Jane so completely cowed that she saw no one. Even her letters became stiff and cold. Well, Paul, you said Basil died a year ago. How? It seems that he and the handyman, a fellow named Christopher were both killed when their car plunged over a cliff and fell into the sea. And, Roger, I'll say this. If it's possible for any man to come back from the dead, that man would be Basil Kovarak. Paul fell silent. It was dark when we reached the coast at Monterey, and soon the road became a shelf with the Pacific Ocean far below on the right, and the Santa Lucia Mountains rising sharply on the left. The highway twisted painfully along the jagged coast. And then I saw it. The house built by Basil Kovarak, hunched up from the granite that surrounded it like a malignant fungus growing out of the stone. It was dark and seemingly deserted. We stopped the car, got out, and ran up a path to the entrance. Paul was about to knock when the heavy door inched open. Miss Craig? Oh, Thank heaven it's you, Mr. Sheldon. And... Uh, this is Roger Elliott. Hello, Miss Craig. Oh, Mr. Elliott, it was wrong of me to call you. My mistress has ordered that no one be admitted. I don't know what to do. I'm sure it was wrong of me well, to call worry. you. Don't worry. You did the right thing, Miss Craig. How is my sister? She's all right, isn't she? Well, sir, she's hard... Miss Craig! Is that oh. Mrs. Hall? Hello, sis. Jane. I turned and saw a woman standing in a wide hallway with a lamp in her hand. For a long moment, I stared, refusing to believe that this could be Jane Sheldon. She was drawn and thin. The muscles of her face were held firm against any show of emotion. But her eyes glistened with a cold, unspoken terror. Oh, Roger. Didn't you get my message? Yes, as a matter of fact, Jane, that's why we came. Miss Craig, leave us at once, please. Very well. I'll be in my room if you want me. Paul, you and Roger must leave at once. Now, Jane, we want to help you, and if you'll forgive me, you look as if you need it. I... I don't want your help. You told me you were fixing the house over, but 
everything's exactly as Basil always kept it. Yes, except the cat. Cat? Basil had a pair of Siamese cats. He loved them, and I gave them away after he was buried. Now I can't locate them. And Basil's coming back. Jane, dear, please. Basil Kovarek is dead. He's coming back, I tell you. Tomorrow's our wedding anniversary, and he's coming back. But, Jane, you saw him buried. Surely you don't think... Listen. <gasps> What's that? Hold it. What music? What was it? The jewel box. The Kovarek jewel box. Basil is in this house. Right now. Jane was terrified. She swayed and almost fainted as Paul and I helped her to a chair. And when she'd recovered, we urged her to tell us what was troubling her. She spoke slowly as if she dreaded the sound of her own voice. That music you heard is the Kovarak music box. It was filled with cut gems when Basil gave it to me. The day he died, it disappeared, and now he's brought it back. Jane, will you tell us exactly what happened the day he gave you the jewel? Well, Miss Craig and Christopher had gone to town for supplies. I was sitting outside on the terrace when Basil called me into the library. I went in, and on the desk was an exquisitely carved casket I'd never seen before. He closed the door and looked at me a long time before he spoke. We are alone, Jane. I'm going to show you something. An inviolable secret. Promise me you will keep it always. Of course. Today is our fifth wedding anniversary. In token of the occasion, I make you this gift. Oh, it's beautiful. One moment, Jane, before you open it. Contained in this box is the lifeblood of the Kovarak family. The key to Kovarak wealth and power. It is a grave responsibility. You may open it now. <gasps> Jewels! Yes. Look at them, Jane. Sparkling and flashing. See, they blaze with a life all their own. The undying fire in those stones has been the symbol of immortality for countless generations of my ancestors. The jewels are yours now. And through them, you are bound forever to the Kovarak. They must be priceless. Oh, I'm afraid to keep them here. We must put them in a vault. No. They will stay here in this house. Under your care. But Basil is so valuable, I'd it's be a afraid. It's a timeless tradition that the wife of the Kovarak heir... Keep the casket of jewels. We will not break that tradition. Someday you may come to realize in what sense that box of precious stones means immortality to the Kovarak. Basil placed the box of gems in my hands and walked out of the library. I took the box to my room and hid it in the bottom of a trunk in my closet. And always before I went to bed, I checked to see if it was safe. After Basil's accident, I went to look at the jewel box. It was gone. A few nights ago, I'd heard it playing. Basil, the last of the Kovarex, was coming back from the grave. Jane was trembling as she finished her grim story. Paul tried to reassure his sister, but he was little comfort to her fear-ridden mind. The flickering lamp sent fantastic shadows dancing through the vast, dark hall as he led Jane to her room. I called Miss Craig, who was greatly relieved to know we were staying overnight. As I got ready for bed, I turned the curious facts over in my mind. I tried to reason an answer, but there was none. Finally, worn out from the long drive, I fell asleep. How long I slept, I had no idea. At first, I thought I was dreaming. Then I realized something definite had awakened me. The music was playing again. Somewhere in the house, the fatal jewel box had been opened. I jumped out of bed and ran out into the hall. Paul's door flew open a second later. In the wavering light of his lamp, we stood listening intently. At last, the music stopped. 
A breathless, waiting silence hung in the air. And then... Roger! That's Jay's. Come on. We ran for the door, thrust it open, and there she stood in the center of the room, staring in frozen fascination at her dressing table. As my eyes followed her gaze, in spite of myself, a wave of sudden horror made my scalp crawl. For I saw, lying on the dressing table, glittering with blood-red malevolence, a huge square ruby. <laughs> Needless to say, the rest of the night was spent without sleep. At last, morning came, gray and damp. I was waiting in the dining room when I heard Jane and Paul come down the stairs. Paul smiled a weak greeting, but Jane, haggard from the sleepless night and exhausted by fear, came directly to me and seized my hand. Roger Paul won't listen to me, but you must. I implore you to leave this house. This is my wedding anniversary, and I know Basil will come back tonight. If you and Paul are here, something dreadful will happen. Jane, dear, that's enough. You're in trouble, and I intend to stay and look after you. If Kovrak comes, I'll be here to face him. Paul, where's the ruby which appeared last night? Why, it's still on the dressing table. Would you mind getting it for me? I'd like to see it. Not at all. I'll be right back. Jane, I want to ask a favor of you. I know that strange and awful things have been happening here, things for which there are no, there's no apparent explanation. Now, you know I firmly believe no man can return from the dead. Please don't give in, Jane. I want you to give me until tomorrow morning to find the answer. Roger, I'm... I'm afraid. Here it is, Roger. Here's the ruby. Oh, thanks. Jane, I think you'd better get some rest now. Don't worry. Leave everything to Paul and me. All right, Roger. I'll try. Poor Jane. This thing's getting her. Me too. Oh, nothing ghostly about this, Paul. A genuine ruby, all right, and from its size, it must be worth thousands. I'd say so. Roger, how did he get on Jane's dressing table? I beg your pardon. Shall I serve breakfast now? In a minute, Miss Craig. Miss Craig, did you ever see this ruby before? See what, Mr. Elliot? This ruby. It was left on Mrs. Kovarak's dressing table last night. Oh, no. Oh, Mr. Elliot, I've got to get out of this house now. When he comes back, he'll get his revenge on me for not telling... Not telling what, Miss Craig? Do you know something about the ruby? Yes, sir. You see, Christopher and I, we were sort of planning on being married someday. But he always had big ideas. One day he came to me in the kitchen and whispered that he'd seen a box of wonderful jewels. Did he say where? He wouldn't tell me, Mr. Sheldon. But he said he was going to steal them and run away. He wanted me to go with him. What did you say? I begged him not to do it, Mr. Elliot. I was afraid. What happened then? That very night, the car ran over the cliff and he was killed along with Mr. Kovarak. Miss Craig, do you think Christopher stole the jewels? I don't know. I knew something was wrong the way Mrs. Kovrak kept searching and searching, so I went through all of Christopher's things, but I never saw any jewels until Mr. Elliot showed me the ruby. Oh, Mr. Elliot, I should have told you before, but I was afraid. I've got to leave here. I can't stay in this house another night. <laughs> With considerable difficulty, we persuaded the badly frightened woman to stay on and look after her mistress. Jane remained in bed most of the day, but as night approached, her courage began to crumble. We gave her a sedative and promised to watch over her through the night, I at her window and Paul in the hall outside the door. Nothing could induce Miss Craig to sleep, and she'd already established a vigil in her room when I took my post outside Jane's window. The storm had cleared and a few stars were visible. But I shivered from the dampness as the hours crept by in slow silence. It was nearly midnight when I heard the jewel box. Paul entered the room immediately, and the music stopped. He came over and spoke to me. Roger, you see anything? Nothing. I heard the music box, that's all. Jane's stirring, but she's still asleep. I don't like it, Roger. I don't like it at all. <laughs> Again, silence descended. Already half the night had passed, and we were no closer to an answer than when we started. I racked my brain for a clue. I felt that at one time, something had been mentioned and forgotten, which now fitted into the picture. But try as I would, it escaped me. I started back in my mind over everything that had happened, when suddenly my train of thought was shattered. I rushed into the room. Paul was bending over Jane, shaking her. Jane. Jane. 
Wake up. Wake up. You're having a nightmare. Oh. Uh, uh. I saw it. I saw Basil. Oh, Jane, Jane, dear, you must have dreamed it. You were asleep. I've been outside the door all the time. No, no, I saw him. He walked through the room. But it must have been a dream, Jane. Your mind is overwrought. He was here, I tell you. I... Look. Paul and I turned to follow Jane's trembling finger. On her dressing table, in the same spot the ruby had appeared, there now lay a great green emerald. I watched fear creep into Paul's eyes. Then he stepped close to me and whispered in my ear. Roger, let's get out of here. All of us. You and I were guarding this room, yet Kovrak got in here and left an emerald. Let's go while we have a chance. Wait a minute, Paul. Now look here. There's something different about the things on this table. They're not the same as before. An emerald's been added. Yes, the emerald's been added, but something... Wait a minute, I've got it. Did either of you touch anything on this table tonight? No, no. Not me, Roger. Why, George, I think I've got the answer. Jane, let me have some of your face powder. Face powder? It's in that box, but what... Roger, you out of your mind. Not a bit. We're going to use powder to catch our ghost. Here, you hold this emerald. Now, I want you and Jane to go to my room. I'll stay here and wait for the ghost. Now, let's see, I'll need something... uh... Yes, this will do, this brass bottle stopper. Roger, please tell us what this is all about. Later, Jane, just do as I ask, please. Wait in my room and be very quiet. And remember, don't come until I call you. No matter what happens. Reluctantly, Paul and Jane left me alone in what they thought was a haunted room. As soon as they'd gone, I went to work. In a few minutes, I was ready. I turned out the lamp and the room was plunged into darkness. An hour of motionless waiting passed. My back ached from the strain. But I knew that the slightest move might upset my entire plan. Then it began. Slow, somber, terrible. The Kovarak jewel box had opened. Suddenly the music stopped. I held my breath and listened. I knew that whatever had opened the jewel box was here in this room with me. For a long moment, nothing happened. Then I became aware of a faint, soft stirring from the direction of the dressing table. Something clicked against the glass surface. I must have moved then, for the chair in which I sat creaked loudly. There was a frenzied rustling and thumping. I jumped up from the chair and lit the lamp. There on the table was a flashing blue diamond, and the brass bottle cap was gone. I ran to the door and called out to Paul and Jane. In a moment, they and Miss Craig hurried into the room. Roger, are you all right? We heard the jewel fall. Oh, the ghost, Mr. Elliot. Where's the ghost? Did you get him? Well, I haven't caught him yet, but I know who he is and where to look for him. Here, Paul, give me a hand with this bookcase. All right. Unless I'm mistaken, we'll find a small hole back here somewhere. There. There. That's enough. Hold the lamp closer. Yes, here it is. A crack in the wall in the corner. Bring that poker over, Paul. Let's rip out part of this wall. All right. Along here? That's my guess. That should be enough. Now let me get my arm in there. Yes, here it is. The cover's been sprung. Listen. It's the jewel box. You mean it's there in the wall? Yes. Just a minute now. It's wedged in. Ah. Here it is. The cover at jewel. Good heavens. Look at them. A fortune. Roger, I, I don't understand. How did you know they were here? You see this powder on the table and the floor? Well, I sprinkled it. Why, there's a trail of tiny footprints for it. Like an animal. Exactly. And it leads straight to that corner by the bookcase. That's the answer. What seemed to be the ghost of Basil Kovarak returning from the dead was actually the work of a notorious kleptomaniac, the pack rat. A pack rat? Why, I can't believe it. It's incredible, Roger. Then Christopher must have stolen the jewels and hid them in the wall when he was making repairs in here. No doubt. And he intended to return for them later, but died before he could carry out his plan. But, Roger, I thought pack rats always took things away instead of returning them. They do. They're natural-born thieves. Now, this section of the wall lies between the pantry and the pack rat's nest. Each time he made a trip to steal food, he was attracted by the jewels. He nuzzled his way into the box and... That's when the music played. 
Then, as he got bolder, he came out into the room here, where he was again tempted by the bright, shiny objects on the dressing table. Now, having no sense of value, he gladly traded this priceless diamond here for a brass bottle cap. The same thing happened with the ruby and the emerald. I got my first real clue when I noticed that your nail file was missing, Jane, when the emerald appeared. And then I remembered the cats. When you got rid of them, you left the way wide open for the pack rat. Oh, Roger, I don't know what to say. I've been such a fool. No, you haven't, Jane. You've got a very vivid imagination, that's all. The fear in your own mind was all that distorted the pranks of a mischievous pack rat into a gift from the dead. And that was the mystery I call a gift from the dead. Golly, imagine looking on your table and seeing a big ruby or a diamond or something. Golly. <laughs> yes, but Johnny, imagine if you thought they were put there by a ghost. Oh, I wouldn't. I don't believe in no ghost. Good for you. You know, even though I don't believe in ghosts either, I, I felt goose simply all over when I heard that music box. It sounded so, uh, so ghostly. <laughs> Well, I suppose that's why we always have to go on proving ghosts don't exist. But if you're feeling a little weak, Ruth, how about a pick-me-up? Hey, uh, I'm feeling weak, too. <laughs> you found it, Johnny. Really, you don't have to be weak or even hungry to enjoy an extra bowl of delicious post-corn toasties. Post-corn toasties are so light, so delicate and crisp. They make a refreshing taste treat any time of day or evening. Uh, shall I go to the kitchen now? Well, don't you want to hear about next week's story? Uh, yeah, but I want but to... But at the moment, the thing you want most is post-corn toasting. Uh, yeah. Well, Johnny, I can't say I blame you. So after I've thanked Horace Braham, Vera Allen, Piggy Carnegie, and Barry Kroger for helping me tell my story for today, I'll tell you in just a few words that next week you will hear one of the most baffling experiences in my entire ghost-chasing career. When I solved the mystery of the disappearing plane. I know you won't want to miss it, so be sure to be with us next week at this same time and for our radio listeners this same station. I'll be waiting for you at the House of Mystery. <laughs> Roger Elliott, your mystery man, saying goodbye until next week and reminding you to try the new Post Corn Toasted, the most delicate cornflakes, extra thin and tender crisp. Mother, doctors agree, never serve children coffee. Why? Because caffeine is a drug, a stimulant. While many people can drink coffee without ill effect, others suffer nervousness, indigestion, sleepless nights. So remember, your children's future is in your hands. Avoid tomorrow's caffeine habit. Start them on Post Them now. They'll love its hearty, grain-rich flavor. And good customs like Post Them last a lifetime. Postum contains no caffeine or other drug. It's America's ideal family beverage. Hearty, wholesome Postum. This program came from New York. Stay tuned to Two Detective Mysteries, which follows in a moment. This is the Mutual Broadcasting.